I am a physicist. I do physics. And physics is math applied to this universe. So most of the time, I do what uh, some would consider normal science. And that is, uh, you get an idea, you write a grant, and maybe it gets proposed, maybe it gets funded, and you do experiments, maybe that leads to new ideas, and so forth. But sometimes, things don't always go according to plan. So in 2006, I received an invitation to go to a conference. It was a topic that I was interested in, and I immediately accepted. But then a reply came back from the organizer, and little did I know the significance of the words in his reply. And I'm not referring to the misspellings, but rather the fact that the conference was coinciding with the World Cup. And of course, I'm a big soccer fan, soccer player, um, and this was, of course, uh, very important to me. I had to go, uh, I had to be a part of the World Cup. And, but there was a problem, right? Nobody gets tickets to the World Cup, absolutely nobody. The seats are empty. Um, <laughs> but uh, really, the problem was, of course, you know, getting a ticket. And uh, when I have a problem like that, I go to my brother, Steve. And uh, Steve, he's a guy who can get things. So he got me a ticket. I was delighted. But that presented another problem. And the problem was that the ticket was for the final. The final occurred 10 days after the end of the conference. So the question is, what am I going to do in Europe for 10 days? <laughs> now, this is a real serious issue because we're talking about taxpayer dollars, right? I mean, I have to go. So basically, I, I invited myself to a, a number of places, beautiful uh, places throughout Europe, uh, gave talks. Uh, one of the places was uh, in Augsburg, Germany. And there, I, my host and his student excitedly told me about their latest unpublished research. And what they were telling me was a type of new math, if you will. And the equation is insulator plus insulator equals conductor. So what that means is you take two materials, both of which are well-known insulating materials, and you put them together. So you have a very thin top layer of lanthanum aluminate, one of the materials, and then another one, which is strontium titanate, and the interface becomes conducting. So this is a big surprise. Uh, furthermore, they found that if they shaved off a few layers so that they only have three unit cells, three building blocks of the lanthanum aluminate, the material would become insulating again, but they could switch it with a battery and turn it to be in the conducting state. And when they turn off the power, it would remain in the conducting state. And they could reverse it also by changing the sign and reverting it to the insulating state. So I was really, uh, I, was, I was struck by this uh, because, of course, this is the basis of any non-volatile memory, like a flash drive. Um, of course, my favorite version is the souvenir that I took with me, right? The soccer ball has inside. Um, so I went to the World Cup. I went to the final. Uh, I must say, I was a little distracted. I did not notice every event, every play. I think some of the referees missed a few of those plays, too. Um, uh, but I had an excuse, and that was that I was really thinking about this, uh, this physics and trying to understand how we might be able to shrink this idea down to something that was you know, maybe millimeters on a side to something really small. And so what I was also thinking about was uh, the boundary of this presentation is Etch-a-Sketch, a toy that I played with as a child. So Etch-a-Sketch nanoelectronics, what is that? Well, basically the idea is um, we are going to try and figure out how to controllably switch this conducting and insulating phase, very much like how the dark and light regions of an Etch-a-Sketch toy works. So if you were to rip one Etch-a-Sketch open, I don't recommend that you do, but uh, you'll find it's a fine aluminum powder inside, and then there's a stylus that can be moved horizontally and vertically by those, those knobs. So, of course, in the lab, we don't use toys, but we work with tools. There's a fine distinction. They're maybe a thousand times more expensive. Uh, and they have a very similar type of stylus, uh, but these stylus is very, very small, and in fact can be used to see, sense individual atoms and apply voltages on very local scales. 
So way, the way that we de developed this was uh, very similar to the Etch-a-Sketch. So we take this AFM atomic force tip and we move it across the surface, applying a voltage, and when we do, we complete a circuit. We can, t we can test this by watching a light bulb light up, for example. Uh, but just like the Etch-a-Sketch, uh, we can actually reverse this process so we can erase these nanowires, and the way we do that is by slowly moving across the wire with the opposite voltage, and when we do so, we can watch this bulb instantly turn off. And in fact, we can use that to see how small these wires are. So we can measure their width. And it turned out, to our great surprise, that they are extremely small. In fact, the distance can be comparable to the spacing between atoms. And the, this one here is about five atomic spacings. Uh, so basically, what we're doing is etch a sketch of the nanoscale, writing and racing nanowires uh, at the scale, the ultimate length scale, the, the uh, atomic scale. And so, of course, there are many potential applications, and we're, of course, interested in that. Um, uh, so they can be classified, for example, as uh, storage, which is this on-off, non-volatile state. We can make uh, very small ones and zeros. Um, but we also know how to make transistors. Uh, and we also think that there's a possibility of using quantum mechanics to do computation. So I want to talk about now, um, uh, I want to contrast the way in which electrons flow in ordinary materials like semiconductors or metals. Uh, it's very similar to pinball or pachinko, the Japanese version, uh, where you have these balls that basically they accelerate and they bang off of something, they accelerate and they bang off of something. Each time they bang, they lose energy and they heat up. And of course, that's one of the main limitations of electronics nowadays is the heat that is generated by the computation, by the electrons that keep banging into the lattice and, and so forth. So uh, we, what we have discovered um, is that the way in which electrons flow in these materials is more like that of a maze. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, there are two guaranteed solutions to any maze. And one is to turn left, and the other one is to turn right. And so electrons in these materials, as, we've, as we have discovered, they execute this type of flow. So for example, an electron might only make a, uh, a left turn and it will go from the beginning to the end. Uh, uh, the other type of electron will only turn right and also will reach the end point. But what's really important is that what they, they execute this motion, they do it without scattering, without collisions, without loss of energy. So this is big. Because electrons move without uh, dissipation, then you uh, have this uh, way to, you have a, a way, a powerful way of doing computation at the very, uh, getting to the very fundamental limits. So it has, uh, needless to say, some enormous potential for applications. So I want to, um, I want to end with a little bit of a discussion about cause and effect. This, of course, is one of the central goals of physics, to understand the relationship between cause and effect. Um, we like to think that we also understand how science works, that uh, if there's this linear progression from idea to experiments and, backward and, and so forth. But when I look back and I think about how all of this happened, I think about how we've discovered these chiral electrons, and I think, well, if I did not have a brilliant graduate student, such a brilliant graduate student, and maybe I gave it to somebody else, maybe they would have uh, not have succeeded at first and have given up and we would have gone on to do something else completely. Um, what if my brother had only got me tickets to the quarterfinal? Well, I wouldn't have needed to go to Augsburg. What if Germany had not been selected? It was a controversial vote. I don't know if you remember that, but they won by one vote. South Africa, of course, had to wait another four years. I mean, who knows, right? What if the Etch-a-Sketch had never been invented? <laughs> so when I think back about what excites me most about being a physicist is the ability that when you, un you finally understand something, and uh, I think it's really best expressed by, by Albert Einstein, who said the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is at all comprehensible. But at the same time, when I think about how science progresses, I realize that I really don't understand anything. Thank you. <laughs>